just like that. I am here with the very smart. He's an amazing dad, amazing businessman, amazing golfer. He's got all those things that he has checked on his career. Scott McNeely, thanks for joining everybody on the or me and everybody listening on the Golf 360. And I'm thrilled to be here. I uh, being formerly famous and important, it's always nice to get on a <laughs> a, a world class, uh, high volume podcast like 360. So. You know, I, I I have told many many people that that you you were the person largely responsible. Ron Wilson played a role because you know we play, Ron is the one to connect us. And it's hard to believe it's been almost twenty years. But when, when I was a very young kid, uh, my mom had gone on a business trip out to Northern California and stopped at Pebble and had bought me a towel and said, "One day you'll play here." And I think I was about eight or nine years old. And it wasn't until two thousand and four, I believe, we were out there and we were having trouble getting out and and made a call to Ron and Ron said, well, I know Scott and I play golf with him. So let me connect you to him. And, and you, you, you made a lifelong dream come true where you, you got my dad and my brother and myself out to play. And we still talk about that today. And I, I had to tell them that all that you were coming on and they were very, very, uh, wanted me to thank you for about the 400th time, uh, for making such a special day for our family. Well, that's a special place. And I'm always excited to share the, the experience with, with somebody. It is a, it is a truly epic uh way to spend uh, a few hours mm -hmm. you know uh, well, well you, you obviously were are a, a amazingly successful business person businessman uh with the companies you started and, and are still involved with and I'd, I'd like to get into that but but probably where you're most known to many of the listeners is as maverick's dad maverick mcneely obviously a, he was number one amateur in the world he played at stanford uh play professionally, got his tour card. And I, you know, as we talked the other day, I, I think he's hurt a little bit, but not you, you, and you have four sons. Um, what did they all play golf or, or did, did Maverick gravitate towards that? And then you introduced them all to sports or how, how did that kind of get started? If we can go yeah, back and I'll, start from I'll the beginning. I'll sort of anticipate the question that I get asked a lot. I, how did you do it? Mm -hmm. And, you know, the four boys are all pretty, pretty outstanding. I, believe in in their own way but my wife and i uh took some unique parenting styles to work one is they didn't get phones until they were 12 or 13 they didn't get social media until they actually got accepted to college they played lots of different sports but as as it went on we basically said you're going to play golf and or hockey or not at all because I like golf, I like hockey, and, you know, I'm not your friend. I am not here to drive all over the world playing 15 different sports with four different kids, and you're just going to do hockey and golf. We liked hockey because it taught physical strength, physical courage, teamwork. It was not a round ball, so it tended to bounce really funny. It was reactive. It was not proactive. Uh, and and it was kind of rough and tumble and you know it it sort of made you grow up and mm -hmm. people don't like jerks and they run them into the boards if you're jerks so if you've <laughs> ever played hockey you know what i'm talking about golf is the gentleman's sport it's reactive it's mental discipline although physical discipline also helps but it's you're not in physical danger but you're in mental danger at every step along the way uh, it was a very individual sport. You couldn't blame anybody. You can't blame your coaches. You can't blame the weather. You can't blame anything. You can, but it's BS, right? Mm -hmm. And so they were two really great sports. I played both. I loved both. I could help them with them. Uh, and having all four boys pretty close in age, we could go to golf tournaments and they could all play. We could go to hockey tournaments and they would all be playing. And that's we went to a hockey rink that had eight rinks and we were running around watching our boys, you know, one would get off his shift. We'd run over to another window and watch. I mean, it, it was just, it was the best. But they slept in the same room, four beds lined up, one, two, three, four. They worked in the same study, which they literally were bumping elbows in the same study. There were no electronics allowed in the room. There was no TV, no phones, no games. We had a game machine that lasted about two weeks, and then it broke, and it never got fixed. <laughs> uh, they went to the same schools. They ate the same food. They they did, they did um, you know, all of the same rules. And we just said, you can do sports only after you finish your homework and if you're getting straight A's. That's all we said. That was our parenting model. 
uh, around sports and all the rest of it. We never forced anybody to go uh, practice golf or whatever. On, su- on Sundays, Saturdays and Sundays, we'd go to brunch at the club. And after brunch, we all went to the range. And if you didn't want to hit balls, we said, fine, go sit in a car. You know, and then we'd bring out the ice cream to the kids who were hitting on the range. And you know, we'd all <laughs> aim at the tractor and we'd be laughing and having a ball. And eventually the fourth kid would come out, you know, I don't want to play hockey or you go tell the coach you don't want to play hockey and then go sit in the car when you're done. (laughs) And then they go in and play hockey. They all became very, very proficient at both. I mean, Dakota, number two, played at Stanford. Uh, Colt, number three, and and by the way, he was doing computer science. So I don't blame him for not being number one in the world. Uh, although Maverick did computer uh, management science and engineering and got his degree in four years while he was Mm -hmm. doing all that stuff. Yeah. That's, that's amazing. Uh, That's pretty, it's pretty impressive. These guys, uh, Colt finished CS in three years at Stanford and, and I, I, I caddied for him at uh, Cal state AMS and all the rest of it. He could have played just about any division one, probably not Stanford, but certainly not doing CS in three years. And then uh, scout did Baylor um golf and p- played on the Baylor golf team and they named a, a a special team award for him after his four years it's called the uh, Scott McNeely award goes to the the best teammate on the team and it's a perpetual award so they're all incredibly great golfers and really great kids they all played uh very high level travel hockey and um but you know it was just mom their mom is, you ask them, are you afraid of mom or are you afraid of dad? Oh, mom. <laughs> you know, she's, she's the tiger mom. And, and uh, she, she, uh, she was not going to let, was not going to be intimidated by these six foot plus super strong boys. She was going to keep them in line. And, and they're all really, really, really good kids. I, I remember uh, you, you and you had invited us over your house after that round of golf and, and introduced us to the boys. And it's hard to imagine. I mean, they, they were all little kids back then. And, and to, to your wife um and and you could see back then that that she let them be boys but she also had them uh, reined in when needed to be because as soon as she either gave them a look or said something that they they whipped right into shape that they knew <laughs> they knew what line not to cross with mom and uh they're all very he, fit we we had a rule that we were going to have a safe house we kept the junk out of the house mm-hmm. and you know it yeah it's going to be meat fruit vegetables you know that's what you're going to eat and if you don't want to eat it and each boy tested us if you don't eat dinner we're going to just put wrap over the top of it and that's your breakfast tomorrow morning and each one of them tried that and each one of them said you know it was better at dinner i think i'll eat it next time (laughs) and then have a real breakfast and uh i i was very clear about if the drugs don't kill you i will and i didn't smile when i said it you know this is just you know, this is just straight parenting. They were not allowed sleepovers. You don't mm. do sleepovers. That's just not going to happen. I don't know what's going on in that other house. I want to know what's going on in our house. We had bedtimes. Scout would go to bed at 7.30. Half hour later, we'd come in and put Colt to bed, and then a half hour later, and then a half hour later, and they're all down. So it's just, you know, routine and all the rest of it. And kids want that. Kids need that. And uh, we let them experiment, you know. You know, rush. If you're a defenseman, rush. Uh, hit a driver off the deck. Those are the kinds of life experiments that uh, the kids can take, and it, it, those are good experiments. And they learn things without causing damage to anybody or anything. So, um, you know, I love sports. I love the academics. Uh, Colt writes his own piano music and plays beautiful wow. piano. Um, it, it's and, and they're all they all have jobs and. Uh, they're all wagering who's gonna who's gonna be the most successful, and Maverick's name seldom comes up as number one. <laughs> <laughs> so the 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 they had the structure provided by um, you and Mrs. And then you, you and and as, in, in addition to that, you allowed them or encouraged them to experiment in whatever uh, task they were doing, be it golf or hockey. You know, as you said, hit, hit it hit driver off the deck, do this, do that, but. I, I would have to say that the character development that they got from the structure, which I think is significantly lacking in today's world. And I, I had a, a fellow, he's a very good friend of mine. He's in the world martial arts hall of fame um, that was on the show. 
uh, a while back, and, and we talked about how his school has just slowly diminished uh, over the decades, as has golf, because he had gotten into golf uh, a number of years ago. He, he, you know, he'd been in martial arts for 40 years. He wanted to get into the golf business as, as something else. But the, the things that, that those two things teach, in addition to sports, but I'll just use the golf analogy and the martial arts and that it teaches patience and it teaches discipline and you're going to fail and you keep come back and you're going to get knocked down and you got to get back up. Uh, that that is in today's society, it seems to be something that is significantly lacking. It's, 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 and, and he gave the keynote speech at the World Martial Art Hall of Fame induction this year. And his speech was all about dopamine addiction, not to get off on a tangent, but just speaking how so many people who, who I coach nowadays, when they come to play golf, the better players in particular, the, the, the higher the handicaps or beginners understand that they, they have a big mountain to climb. But the better players, if they don't get better quick, quickly, really quickly, then they they abandon what they were working on or tend to. Once they, they reach a certain level, as I'm sure you've seen with your boys who played at a very high level, and obviously Mavericks on, on the PGA Tour, they don't abandon it, then they stick to it, especially if they have some history with that coach. But I'm just speaking in general terms that it just seems like some things in today's society are going the opposite direction that they need to. Uh, and it, it's just nice and comforting to hear the success of your boys, uh, given what the the the, fu the fundamentals and principles that your wife and you instilled in them. Yeah, you know, we we made them we made them play sports, not not do video games, and not to not do um, you know all of the social media stuff, and it just it just was ridiculous. So, yeah, I, I I'm I'm pleased with those decisions. I know it's very very hard for parents. We had their passwords all the way through high school. <laughs> and that was it. I, I mean, it, you just have to be a parent. I remember one parent was upset at how her daughter was treating her, and she said, "Where's your phone? I'm taking your phone away." Her her daughter ran and hid her phone so that her mom couldn't get it, and she was asking Susan what to do. And Susan says, "Call AT and T and cancel the account." Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, I can't do that. Well, yes, you can. Yeah, you can. Yeah, you can. Yeah, I can't feed him the food the next morning. Yes, you can, and um, it's um, it's just you you can't be their friend. You have to be their parent. And unfortunately, there aren't enough kids who have both mom and dad there paying attention. And I think there's unfortunately with uh, for a whole bunch of reasons. Some people think they need to have two incomes mm -hmm. uh, because they want all these other things. Yes. But, you know, I, I was fortunate enough to have a, a a wife who had a Stanford undergrad and a Santa Clara graduate degree, and we got married. And she said, "I want to stay home with the boys." And you know, certainly I was wealthy enough to afford that without any any cost to our way of living. But I'd I'd have sacrificed everything, you know, that I had mm -hmm. every golf club I had to be able to give the boys you know, a, a, a full-time mom at home. It was, you know, it was just so, it's just so important, I think. Was there, uh, it, uh, did, did Maverick show uh, a lot of talent and or promise as a, as a young boy growing up? Or was it something that it was more uh, that, that he came to and said, hey, dad, I, I, I want to, I want to achieve this. As a, as a, I want. I want to win an AJG event, or I want to be AJ Player of the Year. Or I want to do this. How, I didn't how did let that... him go do AJGA. I said, Maverick, if you win every amateur event in Northern Cal, I'll I'll get on an airplane with you. But I've never seen a golfer get better in an airplane. And mm -hmm. you know, it's it's like leaving Minnesota to play hockey. You know, to go play hockey somewhere else. I mean, why would you leave Northern California? So. Uh, when he got into Stanford, he had never played outside of Northern California, except he qualified for the U.S. Worlds and went down to Southern Cal for mm -hmm. one event. But that, that's how he got it. He got to Stanford and, you know, his two teammates, one was the number one uh, recruit, Jimmy Liu, in, um, in, the, in the U.S., and then the number one recruit from Australia, Varad Badwar. And Mav was the number one recruit from Portola Valley. California. <laughs> and, you know, it just, um, he, he put his mind to it. We never even, I tried to talk him his senior year out of going pro, even with all of the awards. And 
all the rest of it. And I said, Mav, it's tough, you know, and do you want to be an entertainer or do you want to create value and jobs and all the rest of it? And we sort of uh, came to the conclusion that I'm very supportive of him playing golf if he's the world's best role model. And, you know, by a role model doesn't mean you got to win the most tournaments because mm-hmm. there's a lot of guys who win tournaments that are, uh, I, I wouldn't have dinner with them. Right. So, um, you know, that's, that's what he's doing. And, and I'll tell you what, you see the impact he has, he does, he likes to do kids clinics and, and, uh, the, the executives he meets, you know, KPMG has him at these events and the, the execs just love them, love him, uh, the way he handles himself, his stories and his engagement and, and he's learning from them and they love teaching him. And it's, it's, you know, it, he's doing way more than just pounding a white ball and uh, pretty proud of that. I, I remember the when, when the reports were coming out or the discussion was out there in the golfing world because he he would what did he win like eight events his junior year of of college uh, it was more like his freshman and sophomore years he got adrenal fatigue and he didn't he kind of tapered off and I still think that kind of slowed him out of the blocks he you know he's so motivated he was working so hard and he just sort of got himself run down so he only won like three events his last couple of yeah. years if I remember correctly I, but he wanted to finish his degree too. Yes, and, I remember that. And so, you know, he's he's now back. He's strong. All the rest of it. He he did hurt his uh, shoulder, his SC joint, right where your collarbone attaches. He strained some ligaments there, but he's hitting the ball good. He's made some swing changes. He's very excited about um, hopefully getting engaged before the end of the year somewhere. And uh, feels like he's he's got a better swing and uh, he's stronger and more excited. And he's got a new a new uh, uh, addition to the uh, team Mav is he got engaged about three days ago here on oh, the dock in uh, that's in Tahoe. awesome! Well, congratulations! Yeah, he's very excited. We're we're really excited. We're going. Hurry up and get married. We want grandchildren. So. <laughs> but uh, you you had mentioned that that you had talked to him about not turning pro, and I, I remember that, and I, I briefly was talking to Conrad. I think via text. Uh, back then about something and asked him about that. He said, yeah, I mean, you, you take a kid who's that smart and his degree was in engineering and was it computer science or something else? But uh, it, Management it, it, science and engineering, it, right? Yeah. And it, it and I remember, it, it, I think even the Golf Channel report on that, he, you know, here he is, he, he was the number one amateur. Uh, he had won X amount of college tournaments uh, being compared to Tiger and Patrick Rogers before him. Uh, what did, did he come to you and say, Dad, I'm struggling with this decision. What, what do you? What's your input? Or did, did yeah. he? Was he just kind of not sure what? And then you wanted him to go one direction. How, how, what was that like back then? Well, it, he's always been his own kid. He doesn't want to go against my wishes. He wants to know what I think. Uh, but he makes the decisions. And I said, Maverick, I'm going to play devil's advocate. I mean, everybody wants you to go pro. All the sponsors do. All you know, the PGA Tour wants you to go pro, and all the rest of it. And your school wants you to go pro, and you know, but they don't matter. You know, it's you. You got to decide. You got to decide on the lifestyle. You got to think about it. Do you like to travel? Do you like to live in a hotel? And I think he underestimated how horrible that was. <laughs> yeah, it's not fun. You know, it is not fun, and I think he underestimated how exhausting it is mentally and physically. It, uh, but he wanted to go do it. He really likes to try and get good. He likes the the ultimate meritocracy that golf has been, and I hope continues to be. None of this team crap. We mm-hmm. have a lot of teams out there. This is the ultimate meritocracy, and you're playing the whole field. It's not tennis where you just have to beat six people in a tournament right. to win. you got to beat all 156, plus all of the qualifiers who didn't get in. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I, I think it's, I think that's the beauty of the sport. And, um, uh, I, I, you know, I just, um, he wanted to take that challenge on. I, how, how can you not, uh, I mean, there, there's no big signing bonus. Like, you know, you, you get no. if you're, you know, you're Connor Bedard and, you know, you're the number one draft pick. He was the number one draft pick his year, but there's, there's no guarantees there. So it was um, it was a big decision. I just wanted to make sure he thought through it all. Hey, Mav, you could get hurt. And then three or six years into it, you know, what happens then? 
uh, you know, nobody will want like you. You'll have 154 people out there hoping, you know, you you shoot a, a million. You know, it's, it's, it can be lonely that way, that sort of thing. And so we went through all that stuff. And, and I said, the other thing is there's an opportunity cost. You could start a company. You could create jobs. You could uh, pay salaries and give stock options to people that change their life. You could, mm -hmm. you know, pay taxes. You, you know, your corporation would pay taxes <laughs> and help fund. Well, I won't go there. Um, so there's lots of goods and services that you could bring to the world through your company or, you know, whatever. And you could, I mean, I hired 235,000 employees over my career. And I think most of them would say that were some of the best days of their lives. So, you know, that there's a real psychic income to that. Do you want to pass that up? Cause you know, I, I think he'd be an outstanding business leader and, uh, a hugely high integrity and business leader too, or a politician. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I've always said I would put my four boys in to run America in a heartbeat over anybody that's out there. And then I'm, I'm just biased and all the rest of it, but America would be a very, very different place if people like this, my four boys were running the joint, but they all, you know, turn up their noses. They see the, cesspool that that is so mm -hmm. i mean so we, we went through all this stuff we spent a lot of time uh and he's a great listener he doesn't say much but he listens and then he comes back a little later having thought through it you know we go to the next level of the conversation and then when he said dad i think i want to go and i said all right can i be your agent until you've picked out your team and got everybody going and all the rest of it and so i, I had a ball helping we, we interviewed all the agents we uh, just, it was so fun to go through the interview process with him. And, and then at the end, we said, what do you think? What do you think? We, yep, that's it. Peter Webb, he's awesome. And we've never looked back since. And, and then, he, you know, he picked out his coach and he picked out his, you know, workout guys and all the rest of it. And then, and then we went and negotiated and uh, worked on uh, a lot of the early parts of the, sponsorship deals and then the agent went and cleaned it all up and fixed it and then he walked in and said all right dad you're fired you're no longer my caddy <laughs> you're no longer my agent you and mom are kind of parents mom emeritus, and yeah. parents emeritus <laughs> and you know you don't even need to come and i don't want to hear you cheering in the crowd i just you know just you just be mom and dad you know let me call you and i don't want to talk i don't want to talk golf when i come home and i said yeah i get that i didn't want to talk about my business meetings with my wife or my kids when I got home, I wanted, mm -hmm. I wanted a different world. So yeah, I got fired and I'm happy with that. He didn't pay well anyhow. <laughs> what, 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 um, can you go into a little bit more about what, what that entailed when, when you, when he decided to turn pro and, and, and you and he were getting things together and, and cause a lot of people out there would, would wonder, you know, the, the average person who sits there and watches TV on the weekend, they, they see rookies and the, the, the show full swing. I think, I think those guys did a pretty good job and giving some of the basics of, of tour life, but j just a, a little more introspect or behind the curtain of someone who's at his level is a college superstar, you know, the best amateur out there. And that now what, what is that like going from amateur to pro before you hired the agent? Oh, uh, he, he did it all. I mean, I didn't hit one golf ball for him. Honestly, I, I never went out. Although I did sneak out on the range and hit some balls with him once at a corn ferry event. <laughs> and he had the officials write an official letter saying that I was on probation, which was kind of fun. <laughs> um, that, I mean, I, I, I don't give him swing tips. <laughs> I don't dare. Um, you know, he picks his schedule, all the rest of it. You know, we, we're just there. We go to, when we go to the tournaments, we say, call if you need company. If not, you know, Susan and I just have a ball traveling and walking the courses and, just enjoying. I mean, there's there's nothing more fun. I mean, I've probably seen forty thousand of my four boys in in sporting events, and 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 I just miss it. I I even go watch my boys practice hockey now if they're playing in an adult league. And they go, Dad, what are you doing here? I just love watching you guys play. And I said, When you have kids, you'll get it. And so, oh, we're just spectators, and and we didn't really do much. Um, you know, I I um, he's he's 
he's hired a full team. He manages them. He calls me every now and then and said, Dad, let me, what should I do for bonuses this year? What should I do for raises? You know, and, and I would walk him through compensation theory and strategy. And I'd say, you know, give me the pros and cons of each. And we, we talked through that stuff. But I said, ultimately, it's your decision. Here's mm-hmm. what I think makes sense. And then he, he'll go modify it. So it all works out great. It's, it's fun. Uh, all of my boys, well, three out of my four boys, Mav included, use me a lot. And the fourth one says, I want to do this all on my own, and I don't want to talk to dad about it. <laughs> cool. I'm good with that. I never talked to my dad about my job, but I'm here if you want me. And he does come every now and then when he's got something that really is he's wondering about. He'll come see me. They all trust me, and, and I trust them and force them. I've also learned that if I make the decision, I'm responsible, and I don't want to be responsible. No, not anymore. You, you've, had a, you've had plenty of that in, in your career. Yeah. I'm responsible doubt. I want to be an irresponsible grandfather. <clears throat> That's my goal. Yeah, uh, Bob Kepka was on, uh, God, it's hard to believe it's a couple of years ago, but it, it, it seems to me that it, as you talk about Maverick and, and all your boys in general who are very good at what they do, uh, the Kepka boys, it, it, that the parents really, contrary to what popular opinion might be, the parents didn't drive the kids to want to succeed at whatever endeavor they were involved in. The, the kids either innately had that or they picked that up from watching their parents who were who were pursuing their own interest in, in their own careers and and, and not giving up and, and doing that it just seems like th- th- there's a principle that is if you pursue something you know your kids are going to pick up on that they might be young and they might be maybe not wise to the ways of the world as young uh kids or adolescents or teens or what what age they are but they pick up on those things and they watch and they observe and they learn. And I, I think that's a testament to all parents out there who, whose kids do have that type of drive. They, they, you're not just born with something like that. May, maybe you are. I, I shouldn't speak to that as, at that type of level. But it, it seems like in today's world of, of talk of skill development, whether, be it in golf, you know, Bryson DeChambeau with the skill development of how to hit it longer or uh, any, anyone that, that's coaching an individual on, on how to improve their short game or their iron game, whatever part of the game. But it seems like in, in every across the scope of anything on the on the planet right now it, it's skill development seems to be the tag phrase that people can learn something in particular but i think that that, that part of people who are young men or women who are successful at a sport or anything else you do usually look at the parents and they were successful or driven or at least set a very very strong foundation for those kids to to jump off of we we tried to we tried to teach them about nutrition when they did dry land practice and a lot of weight room stuff and stretching for hockey and for golf, uh, we didn't get drunk in front of them. We didn't do drugs. Uh, we went to bed at regular hours. We didn't. Um, we we just didn't screw around. We were we were we were very. We had seriousness of purpose. The other thing we did is we put them into lots of sports, mm-hmm. and we told them you can only play sports if you get your work done. And we didn't do their homework for them. He said, you go to office hours. I'm not going to do your homework. You get it done. And if you can't get straight A's, you don't get to play. So we sort of made sports dessert mm-hmm. as opposed to a lot of people. I never told them to go practice. I, I told them, did you get your homework done? Are you getting A's? Okay, you can play if you want. And they'd run out and go. You know, it was, it was just a, a reward and a treat. Not, I, I went to one junior tournament and this little girl about seven comes off and her mom goes what'd you shoot she goes 48 that's terrible you knew what was bad my putting well you got to go putt she goes i'm hungry can i have lunch no you go putt then you Mm. can have lunch i wanted to punch the lady like are you kidding me how in the world can you support a kid by screaming at him? Now, maybe the kid will become the next great LPGA player, but I, I certainly wouldn't want my kid to marry that. No, I, I, th- th- they might become great, but they're not going to be a very happy or productive individual outside of their sport, if that's the case. Yeah. I mean, so you see, all, I mean, you know, success comes in many different ways and it can be measured in many different ways. Uh, um, it's. Um, we we did it our way, and uh, I I think I think our four boys will probably raise their kids that way because I think they yeah, they enjoyed. I think it. it worked out pretty good. They realize now that 
they, they have a huge jump on a lot of people just with their discipline and focus. Mm-hmm. As far as golf and, and, and Maverick is uh, of the agent and he's a big enough name. Um, was he, do you know if he was approached by live at all uh, as they were coming um, on the scene and now are established? I do know that Mav was very loyal to the PGA tour. I asked him multiple times, why don't you just go talk to them? You don't have to join them. Just see what they're saying and see what they're talking about. And he said, no, I, I like the tour. I like, the approach, I, I I like the meritocracy. I I he doesn't want to be given a big contract. He wants to earn it on course. Mm-hmm. That's not to say he won't take a nice contract from a sponsor, but he earns that too. I don't think yeah. there's anybody who works harder on his service days than Maverick does to give a a return to his sponsors. And you know he he puts on Under Armour and he puts on AT&T and Cisco and all the rest, MGM. And he says, I'm repping those companies. I'm, I'm trying to make them more successful. And, and he takes that job very, very seriously. Um, and so I, I don't think he was interested in repping, you know, the Saudi government. That just wasn't, I think, I don't know. I, he never really said it that way, but I think that's what he was thinking. He said, I want to, I want to rep me and my, my sponsors. Mm-hmm. And so he never did talk to Liv that I know of. What well, is someone for, for, from a business standpoint, and obviously you were very, very intelligent and smart with your career in business. And from a person who has a, a son that, that plays on the PGA tour, do, do you have an opinion one way of live or the other, or, or any thoughts on, on that whole dynamic? Yeah, I guess I would, I would probably share with the players that I think you ought to think about something. Uh, and, and I don't think the PGA, I think the PGA Tour has had enormous scope creep and gotten way out over its skis and way out left and right field, out of bounds of where they should be. They shouldn't be running all these other tours. They mm-hmm. shouldn't be, you know, doing all these, you know, TV channels. They shouldn't be building huge headquarters. They shouldn't have uh, 80% of their staff. They shouldn't be, uh, I mean, it's a 501c. Six. Now, the the salaries being paid all the way up and down the line for a nonprofit stunned me. Stunned me, and I don't think you should be doing PIP, Player Impact Program. That's just bribery. Let's just call it just trying to bribe people to stay. They spent enormous amounts of money there. I wonder why you need to make elite events and piss off other sponsors who aren't I, I, I there's a whole bunch of strategies and things that they're doing um i i think the model if you just said the pj tour is going to focus on 40 tournaments and that's it we're not going to do the senior tour we're not going to excuse me the champions tour i'll get <laughs> i'll get all my buddies <laughs> freddie and Marco Miro be calling this this champions tour. All right, but all the feeder tours and growing the game and all those other things, it, you'll grow the game just by focusing in on those forty great tournaments mm-hmm. and make sure that the goal is purses, pensions, and charities. That's our goal. Nothing else. And we want to maximize those things. If you look at the live model where it reports to an LLC, which is a for-profit, I can tell you that purses, pensions, and um, charity, those are expenses, not goals. Mm -hmm. And that is a complete switch in the model. I mean, do you think down the road that, the players in live are going to get to wear their own Jersey. I mean, Maverick has Cisco, AT&T, Under Armour, Callaway, MGM. I I don't think they can. Now I I, I think that the, from from some people told me that they're not, if their contract was there when they came to live, but once that contract expired, I think they were required to wear the, the team logo. That's, that's it. Now what you're doing is you're putting this not for profit that was really focused on the members. Now, I think they got their focus way out of whack. And I think they could literally take 
hundreds of millions, if not more, out of their spending structure by just focusing on purses, pensions, and charities on 40 tournaments, and that's all. Mm -hmm. If they just focused on that, just laser focus, every CEO in the world has done scope creep. And every board of directors has not managed expenses and charter well enough. And I think, I think the tour has, you know, with the advent of big contracts, could have just grown pen, pensions and purses and charity more rather than, you know, corporate jets and all these other things. So, I, I, and, and I think the worst thing you can do to the game of golf is put the best players in a for-profit corporation as opposed to a an independent nonprofit for the members of the members. And I think what's really wrong is I think the 430 card members should vote on every issue and not a board of directors, not a CEO. <clears throat> The, the commissioner should just implement. And if 60% of the players vote on a resolution and say, yes, then you implement that resolution. If they don't, you rewrite the resolution until you got at least 60% of the card carrying members saying this is the right thing for purses, pensions, and charities. Yeah. And if you're the commissioner and your task is, or your responsibility, or one of them is to make sure that the that you're doing the, the things that the, that would benefit the players, which is what I think would, you know, obviously keep them happy. And you're working on their pensions, you're working on scheduling sponsorships, whatever it is that the players are going to vote on. That either, if they vote it down, you either haven't done a good enough job explaining it, the benefit of what they are, or the, the product or whatever you have put together is not quite complete and it needs to work, which is why they voted it down. It's well, not yeah, just... or or it's a dumb idea and it, it isn't working on purses, <laughs> pensions, or <Exactly>. charity. <laughs> yeah, it, it it seems like, you know, and Simon Sinek has but he's made a career about, you know, the, the it all starts with why. It seems like the PJ Tour has kind of lost their their beacon of what guided them. And that as you mentioned, they got off on all these different tangents and now you've got the size and the scope of the entity itself gets so big and the tentacles are so far. It's like, well, if, if you try to pivot the, the whole ship, it, it's so big. It takes so long to turn and so hard to turn it that they can't do it. And streamlining it and making it extremely efficient, as you said, it'd be like, well, that's but kind it, of the goal, isn't it? Elon Musk took uh, like 70, 75% count out, right? You know, it's, <laughs> you know, and nobody in headquarters is hitting a golf ball. I, Mm -mm. And, you know, it, so I don't know. I, I, I'm from the outside. I may be dead wrong, but that's just how I see it. I just am scared to death to see uh, the PGA Tour get rolled under a for-profit because a for-profit will dominate a non-profit. And all of a sudden, those three magic things become things you want to minimize, not goals that you want to maximize. Do, and do, I, don't think, I, I don't think I've never heard a player one player actually articulate do you realize what's going on if we do a deal with a and and report into an llc do you realize how that completely changes you from a member owned and run unfortunately they don't realize that they're members and they have a vote and they just think it's okay that i don't vote on anything and that i get some no no it's just take control of your tour mm -hmm and and go make it happen and and be you don't have to vote you should have a player rep that you trust your dad your agent your financial advisor who will evaluate come back and tell you and then there should be votes every month on should we extend the season should we do pip should we do this should we do that should we do that? Should, should we do a deal where we report to an, an llc no i don't think if they knew they would get three votes for reporting, because uh, tell me, let me tell you, in 10 years, a for-profit organization will do its best to make sure that all the money goes to the investors, not mm -hmm. to the members. Yeah, that, 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 as, as you described that, it, that, that was my issue with uh, Live and why I was very surprised. And, and I was sad to see that the PJ Tour 
went to the plate and said, let's negotiate because I didn't see the live model lasting because I don't see how you're going to pay players that much if you're in a for-profit entity because after the, the first couple waves of players went, and I think Cam Smith arguably would be the last name player that, that went to live, but I didn't see many of the younger guys going to, to live. And I'm looking at it like, okay, if you, if you have, I think what they did from startup to the first year was actually absolutely incredible from a business standpoint. I think from the end of the first year to the end of the third year, I thought they had a lot of challenges in front of them as far as a, a profit coming back in. And how are they going to maintain that model? You can't just pay guys 10, 20, $120 million a year and expect it to, to grow. Maybe it doesn't, maybe I'm misunderstanding the international stage or not, but I was, I was interested to see how that panned out, and I was also, but I was also very um, saddened to see that the PJ Tour had tried to match them. I, I thought personally that that was a complete wrong avenue to take, as far as, especially when they they came out in the early stage and said it, it's more about honor and integrity, which I think their message was trying to get across. Look at look at all the good that we do for charity. Look at the things that we do in this game, and. Uh, th they decide to go on their integrity, and then the very next week or two weeks later, they come out and say, "Well, we're playing for these elevated purses." It's like th that's completely hypocritical. Yeah, uh, their their customer is the viewer and the sponsors, and that's what they should. And they're not stupid. On. Those the, you know, customers and sponsors, or the viewers and the, and the sponsors, are not ignorant or, or dumb. It's yeah, like I, you know, I, we, I I just simplify when things get tough. St simplify, streamline, and make sure it really matters. And mm -hmm. You know, it's it's just you know even a nonprofit should operate that way. But I think a nonprofit, the members should be voting, and it should be they should be voting on everything, not getting surprised on a Saturday morning that something. Yeah, that, that that's amazing. And then some of the guys, and I, I've had a couple on the show that they said. Oh, by the, the way, way that... these are all my views. They're not Mavericks. I don't want to get him in trouble or whatever. I I just I you know I'm just I'm coming at it from having been in the CEO hot seat. Mm -hmm. And having been on board of directors and having watched, you know, and and been in nonprofits, I, I, I just, I just think there's so much opportunity for the PGA Tour, but it needs to focus, streamline, scope, sc trim the scope, and and just get laser focused on those three things for, and and, and then a, uh, that'll create a great product for. Sorry, my phone's ringing all the time. Uh, that'll create a, a really great product for the sponsors. And, you know, and, and if, the, if the members are understanding where the revenue's coming from, the fans and the sponsors, I guarantee you they'll be laser focused on providing entertainment and hospitality and a class act. Because mm -hmm. people need that. I mean, we need that in sports. We need it. We yeah. need one sport where, you know, they're not wearing joggers. I, oh. I I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> cracking a joke there, but I mean, you know, it's it's sort of nice to see dressed nicely people acting sort of like. I don't mind an occasional Sally, but you know, it isn't like look at me, look at me all the time. Look mm -hmm. at the results, and that's what golf's all about. It's a number at the end, and the, and the numbers are impressive. Speaking of numbers, you were when you were in your working career, uh, you for many years were Golf Digest number one golfing CEO, and I can't. I was your. I think it was hovered around zero to two. Your handicap at that time, if, if I remember. Yeah, I guess I got the best I was was plus one point six. I think was the best I ever was, but it was the Fortune five hundred CEO list, and there's a funny story about that. I mean, I. I, it probably made some shareholders nervous, but uh, it actually <laughs> paid off nicely because one year I came up the list, um, I actually started um, getting some lessons from a guy who really fixed me and got me on a heater. And I got to about a three handicap or something. And I was number two behind Jack Welch, the, you know, just like the Tiger Woods of CEO. Mm -hmm. And so I've been dying to sell him workstations and do leasing with them and all the rest of it. So, and I never met him. So I tore the sheet out of golf digest and I scribbled on it. Jack, number one versus number two, mano a mano, you name the place, the time I'll be there, Scott. <laughs> and I, 
<laughs> Three days later, and that's how long it took mail to get to. I got this phone call. You're on. <laughs> and he he set it up, and and we had we played for three years. He beat me the first year because he made me fly in overnight, and I played. I was dipped, dipped. he's a pretty darn good golfer too. But anyhow, I beat him the next two years, and then he didn't want to play anymore. So but, it's uh, too you know, bad I, they they didn't have the you know the streaming and everything else back then. You guys could have had the match. Oh, there, like, there was a lot of trash talking going on. It would have been it would have probably needed to be r-rated or something but anyhow it led to jack uh ge was a multi-billion dollar customer of ours big leasing partner of ours and i ended up on the the ge board i walked in in blue jeans and a golf shirt he said you can do one of the board meeting like that and i said yeah am i the first one to ever do that and he said yep and i said great and he like, we, we had a we had a great he was a great guy i loved loved the guy and uh miss him but uh, he was he was a real inspiration. What, what, was that a Silicon Valley type thing? And and that at that time, you know, you, you everyone there seemed to have that more or less rebellious state against the 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 blue blazers and and the suits and the and the pinstripes of, of say the IBMs of the world. And did did you do that? Walk into a meeting like that because that's kind of the uh, culture that you were coming from, or did you just do it just to irritate Jack? Uh, wool itches me, and so I'd get in these wool suits, and it just it would be itchy. And I just I, I wore blue jeans. I, my my deal. Steve Jobs was really the first one. He did the blue jeans and the mock black. So mm -hmm. I just did a white button down, blue jeans and a and a blazer if I had to be around customers, but but no ties. I wore a tie in high school, and I hated it. So <laughs> I, I just don't like ties. Uh, the uh, the did did that as the board and the company that you were running, Sun Microsystems, which if anybody can, if they don't know you, they can look it up very easily and Google your name. I mean, you got a multi-billion dollar company. Did did that allow you, or did they come to you and said, "Look, if you want to play more golf, uh, that that you're going to get us into these places. It's actually a benefit to the company. Have at it." Or were you so laser focused on what you want to do with the company that you said, "Look." it's nice to have this perk and it's nice to say that uh, I'm now the number one CEO golfer and I'm, I'm in golf digest every year. And it, it, you know, it's something I really enjoy uh, to have that acclimation or what, what was that like at that time? I, I, you know, I was single till I was uh, 39. And uh, so, you know, I, I couldn't work all day, every day. And I had buddies, so we would do golf trips and stuff. And it was just my, that, and I was on five hockey teams at one point. Uh, <laughs> so, so that, you know, whenever I was around, I could go play a hockey game at night. Sometimes I played three in a row and that sort of thing. I had to give it up because, you know, the, you usually don't get done till about midnight or one, and then you got to have a beer or two just to slow down. Mm -hmm. And then I walk in a little bit tired and that wasn't good. So I, I, my job was number one. My wife and kids were, uh, number 0.5, they were up above that. And, you know, golf was just a, a release. It turns out my golf went downhill after I retired because when I played golf as CEO and as dad, I didn't care what my score was. So I played loose. I played, I just, I was gunning for it. I was, you know, getting every putt to the hole and all the rest of it. And I was a really good putter for some reason. I don't know why. I played four rounds with um the the black knight gary player in a charity we walked four rounds in scotland in one day i mean like wow. uh, i had blisters this big on the bottom of my feet <laughs> but uh he beat me once i beat him once we tied once and then he beat me on 18 on the last hole to win it but he said to me at the end he said you're the best putter i've ever seen in the world quote unquote and then but he hadn't seen my son i saw earlier this year maverick before he got hurt, was leading in all six categories of putting. That that's They're, impressive. I, I don't know if anybody's ever done that. I'd like to check and see, but he, strokes gained, um, three putt avoidance, uh, you know, five feet and under putting. Uh, er, in six categories. He was he's a pretty good putter. So I I'd think now so. he's got his new swing. I'm excited about about him. But no, the the that was just fun. That was just good advertising for Sun Microsystems. And, you know, when the stock went down, everybody goes, stop golfing. <laughs> I haven't played. <laughs> I, I did learn to only post scores on the weekend. Very smart. Because people can look it up. 
there were CEOs who were posting scores, you know, in Hawaii and all these other places in the middle of the week. Dumb, <laughs> really dumb. <laughs> When when you and uh, Ron Wilson were playing, when he was out there coaching the Sharks, because um, he would come home back here and say how he he would always play with you, um, who, because Ron was a hell of a player. I think he I don't know what he's his hand very good, was. very he hit, hit it a mile. I remember the year he all came hockey back. Hockey players, all hockey players hit it a mile. Yep, and and we for some reason we have a number of hockey players that have lived or lived in Hilton Head area. I mean, Ron Ron's here. Uh, Mark Messier was here for. 30 years uh they recently sold their uh one, most of their properties here he still has one left robert lang was here um i can't but there's a, 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 a the two brothers from it was it uh quebec uh was not not uh, surge and they, they won like nine championships way back in the 60s i can't remember um not, nonetheless uh, but a, a fair number of hockey playing you're right they hit it a mile um and I've, it's been fascinating that when I play with these guys that, that, that they can move it as well as they can. Some of them are, are obviously they're in fantastic shape and they're very strong, but do you have any theory as, as a hockey player and the, the father of four boys who played hockey and golf? I mean, assuming it's from the same side of the ball, it's obvious to see where a lot of it can come from. Well, it's interesting. Uh, Matt's the best player. He shoots right and he golfs right, but it probably hurts your hockey because the, the theory in hockey is that you grab the stick with the top of the stick with your dominant hand because you never one hand, you seldom one hand with your lower hand. You one hand the stick with your your top hand. So you want that you want that to be your dominant hand. So Maverick is right handed, but he he shot right. And I think that probably helps his golf a little bit. You'll notice a lot mm-hmm. of the Canadian golfers shoot left, uh, play golf left handed because they're right handed and they, they shoot left. Mm-hmm. So it's it, but I, my theory on that is that the eye hand, the core strength, the balance. When you're on skates, you're almost always on one foot on one edge, either the inside or the outside edge. So the ability to balance and and the proprioception and all the rest of it of you know from the tip of your stick all the way yeah. down to your toes, you are your balance and your strength and your speed and. You, and there's a lot of touch in hockey that people don't realize. Some of these touch passes that these guys are doing. Um, so the short game is 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 there in in hockey also. And you know, if you've gone into the corner and you have like I, uh, one of my buddies, uh, the Hammer from uh, uh, Montreal Canadiens, he was this top, had the hardest slap shot, biggest guy. He plays golf. He just crushes the ball and. <laughs> Going into the corner against him and a 10-foot putt, the 10-foot putt's not scary. No. <laughs> so, you know, it does, it does teach you a, a level of, hey, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to break a leg if I miss this 10-footer. Did, did you ever play in the, uh, the celebrity tournament, the one at, is it at Lake Tahoe? No, I didn't. Uh, I, um, I, I was, you know, Annika is a good local friend and she plays in and I, I go watch Joe Pavelski. He's my favorite hockey playing golfer. Um, mm-hmm. Although watching uh, Burns hit the, hit the golf ball is, is a real treat because it's, it's long and wrong. It's just so fun <laughs> to watch, but um, so yeah, no, I've never played in that. I you know my big deal was always to play in the AT&T Pro-Am. I did that probably close to two dozen times and that's, that's got that had to be a blast absolute blast absolute blast the, the whole week I, I would imagine that just everybody there at the lodge and just do, doing their thing in in, in town and dinner well, i think and, a lot of the daddies out there would agree that i i got one of my bucket list items checked off when i got to play in the pro-am with my son yes that would be awesome he made the it, cut i didn't <laughs> But he, did he keep you around? I, I don't remember the form. Like, if, if he makes the cut, does the team, do you guys keep playing? No, the team has to make the cut. I played a lot with pros who didn't make the cut, but the team did. So they had to play on Sunday. It was, mm-hmm. They'd much rather have gone home. But 
The uh, w- w- when you were I, I, one question I had for you, w- which is largely would be c- come from a lot of the general managers in the golfing business and head pros, directors of golf, and things like that. Obviously, when they're managing a golf facility, it's even if it's thirty six or fifty four holes, it, it's a few hundred employees maximum. It's not thousands and tens of thousand employees like like you've had over your career. But the the question would revolve around as far as the, the culture within the the business or the entity itself how do you maintain that over years and and decades because it, it, it there, there's so many variables that come in and try to infect that uh what, what what would you tell them for anybody who would be out there sitting saying man i wish i could ask someone who has had his success and at his level what he did with tens of thousands of employees across the country i mean I, th- they have them all there on the same property yeah but, I, I i i think the the rule of there's basic rules that I tell. I do a lot of advising to corporations and small and large, mostly younger ones. And, and there's a few big rules that I think are really important. Be participative, not con- but not consensus. So ask everybody. I think there's a big rule of everybody you run into, you say, hey, if you were me, what would you do differently if you were in charge here? And then listen to them and then talk to them a little bit about why you're doing what you're doing. And I'm going to take what you're saying into consideration and maybe we'll tweak it or whatever. Or you'll explain to them why you're not doing it. And they'll go, oh, that makes sense. And then Mm -hmm. you resolved a real big issue one way or the other. But you can't, you ask the pin cutter, you ask the maintenance guy, you ask the the agronomist, you ask everybody, what should we be doing that we're not doing? You ask the customers, you ask the, the, every, every time you see a player, Hey, everything good. Oh, I saw a sprinkler was, you know, broken over on the fifth tee, you know, whatever you learn so much. If you just ask the golden question, what should I be doing that I'm not doing? Um, and that's important. And then the second, the other piece of it, I would say is you want to have as many people reporting directly to you as you can handle. And Mm -hmm. that's about 10 to 12. If you only have five or six, that's too vertical. There's not enough communication up and down because you lose, you lose fidelity of the message for every layer. And so if you have, I I always say you lose 20% of the message each layer. And so if you have five layers in your organization, that's 0.8 to the fifth power, do the math that says what you say is not getting to the bottom. So Mm -hmm. flatten the org chart and have them all at the table, be participative, but not consensus, have a very quick decision-making process. You do all of that. And then um, just, you know, it's like a hockey team, five, five comments of uh, constructive, positive, Hey, great job. And one, you know, criticism. You got to have that ratio and you, everybody's a kid. Everybody wants to feel like they're doing a good job and everybody wants to please the coach and, and just understand that. And, um, you know, I, I think, uh, at, at first they'll be skeptical. The guy, you don't really care. And after you keep asking and you keep showing and you keep saying good job and, the, and they're sincere, good jobs, and then they'll take the criticism and they'll go fix it. Mm-hmm. And uh, and all of a sudden, you'll have a great golf course, a great culture, uh, happy, happy members, and um, and the owners will be making money. <laughs> That's always good. You know, I, I, and I asked that question. I had Randy Soma, who was president of Worldwide Operations for Johnson Controls. He was he's a dear family friend, and um, he was one of the early shows that I did. And he had said one of the things they did when. There were two things, really. He said that at their management meeting, they asked, the first question they asked is, wasn't what will we do to, to reach these goals that we have set, is what won't we do under any circumstance? Meaning they're not going to violate their ethics and morals. To get, they're not going to cut employees to, to hit a number of Wall Street thinks they should. And then the second one that he was surprised, and it, it leads to what you said, is they went around, they had an independent company come in, they hired them to go around to the employees and ask them what they thought was needed to, for the company to be better. And he was very surprised that one of them, or, or more than one, but a, a, a high up on the list was that the entry level or uh, the, the, the lower part portions of the com- corporation did not know or feel that they knew anything about the management. So 
something that they did very simply was not only on the company website was to put the biographies of each of the upper management positions, but they were required from him all the way through that, the whole team to go into the cafeteria. I don't know how many times they did it once a month, once every quarter, whatever it was, but to have lunch and just hang out with the people who work for them so they could get to know them, that they were not just a, a number or a figurehead. One side's not looking at the other is just on a perch or at the top of the mountain, and they're not looking down on them as just some number on a spreadsheet. And he said he could not believe that the change that it made not only for he and the management team, but also for everybody throughout that it was more of a cohesive unit because you're, you're talking to people. You're not just getting a directive from somebody. Or you're not just looking at a number to say, okay, we have X amount of employees and benefit pro pro programs and so on. So the, the key, there was a better cohesiveness amongst the company. And they, they were a fortune hunter company as well. And it, it's amazing that those small things and, and a simple question, like what should we be doing, but we aren't make the biggest impact. Well, you know, I think, Going back to the PGA Tour, I think maybe the PGA Tour got too focused on sponsors, the competitors, the uh, um, maybe even the fans, and didn't focus enough on the players and getting their input and asking them, what do we need to do, and, mm -hmm. and, and setting up that process. I, I don't know. I, I you know Again, I'm not on the inside. I'm not on the board or anything like that, but, um, you know, it, it sort of makes me nervous. I, I've known every CEO at AT&T forever. And Randall Stevenson was one of those stand-up guys. And I just hate to, uh, I mean, it, it just, it was a gut punch to me to see him leave the board. Oh, wow. oh my gosh. Yeah. I mean, he's the one guy there that has been CEO. Mm -hmm. you, you can't lose, you, if you're going to build a board, you got to put multiple people who have been in the pinata and that's what this being ceo is you're in a pinata it's a very tough job i i i don't envy the job that um monahan has it's a the ceo job is the toughest job out there and uh, he, he, you know you have all these constituencies you have no peers it's hard yeah you, you you're the one who if somebody makes a mistake below you, you're you're the one that takes. You're the heat shield. You're the one taking the fire and say, "Look, I'll you, you, that, that you made a mistake. We all do. Go ahead and fix it." Now, if they're, of course, if they're making them over and over, you got to get rid of them, or they do something so far off the grid that that you have no choice. But I'll take the brunt of it. I'll go to the press conference. I'll talk about it, and you're, you're just getting berated and raked over the coals. But again, that's part of the job and why it is very difficult to do. I don't know if. Many people who haven't run anything understand that where you, you are the per, you are the point person and everything runs through you in a good way and a bad way that you're not the sole decision maker, but you're the one that catches shit when it hits the fan. And, but you, and you, you should be dispersing the praise, at least in public when it, you know, when the praise and, comes your way. Well, there's a great country Western song, you know, it's, I hear it's lonely at the top, but for sure it's lonely at the bottom. So <laughs> there, there, there are some advantages to being yeah, seen, you know. <laughs> um, you know, in your in your industry, in the in the tech industry, you you were very familiar with things changing very rapidly from from the almost the dawn of of the tech sector, and and you were instrumental in that all all through the eighties. Uh, I'm sure that you were. You had some involvement in that or even before, so or at least we're watching it when you were, I think you were at American Motors, if I'm not mistaken, I'm trying to recall from when we talked playing golf almost 20 years ago. But uh, where I'm going with this is the, the golf world, as well as the world we live in, is experiencing things that are happening very rapidly, whether it's equipment or coaching or changes in theories about di different things. How does the, the person sitting at home who enjoys golf on a weekend or you know Thursday or Friday afternoon uh, during the telecast, how does somebody like that take the inordinate amounts of information they're being bombarded with and sift through it to, to figure out what is going to work for them to keep it enjoyable so that they don't say, God, this is just too much. I'm done. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to the beach or I'm going to, to, to go do something else. This is golf has just got like everything else. I, I, I think golf is so simple. You start at the T markers and you chase 18 cups and try and get it in the fewest number with a common set of rules. Everybody has the same venue, the same. And it's so simple. There's not any team things. There's no drafts. There's no, 
salary caps. There's no, you know, union strikes. There's no, you know, people kneeling on the field, you know, during the, I mean, it's just so simple. It's a gentleman's game. It's uh, been played forever. We have historical data on everything. You don't need to change it. It's doing just fine. Um, the purses are growing because it, people want to watch it. But what's mm-hmm. really unique, I can't go play baseball. I can go play softball or whatever, but it really isn't the same. But I can go play the same course, the same mm-hmm. equipment, and I can compare. And I can really understand. I really don't understand what uh, – I can't remember his first name, Judge, the baseball player who hits the monster. Oh, Aaron, I really yeah, don't Aaron Judge. I, I, you know, I – I can't throw a ball without throwing my arm out, much less, you know, <laughs> hit a ball out of a park. But I can I can sink a 20-footer every now and then. You know, I I can get a birdie, too. I even eagle every now and then, you know. And, and mm-hmm. you, you, it is so relatable. And, you know, you see Sergio digging up the trap after he couldn't <laughs> I do that all the time, Serge. <laughs> it takes a little longer to rake, but it's over. <laughs> it's so relatable, and and that's the beauty of the game. We all understand how how could I miss a five footer? Well, they did too. You know, it's um, so I love the game. It's 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 it's. There's nobody to blame. There's no one else, nowhere else to look, and mm-hmm. and it's you know it's. It's sort of sad when you see a pro miss. It's funny as heck when I see my buddies miss. You know, we're all doubled over laughing and saying, oh, that cocktail didn't do any good, did it? You know, and it's all, you know, it's just, it's the best, it's the most social game. Um, you know, it's the, it's the most frustrating game. It's the most, you know, exciting game. It's got luck of all kinds, good and bad. Um, mm-hmm. You know, just don't mess with it. Don't screw with it. It doesn't need live. It doesn't need teams. It doesn't need jerseys. It doesn't need anything. Um, you know, and I think the members ought to vote whether we want to see the players' calves or not. You know, <laughs> I mean, I, I love watching Tom. I love his personality, but I don't love his calves. I didn't want to <laughs> see those. But that's just me personally. It's not. It's not a judgment or anything. I just didn't want to see them. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, I, I don't know if I have another question. Then we covered most everything. But I, I, if it's okay, we'll take the last amount of time we have. I, I usually I have an uh, emergency nine. They're just nine random questions that I Far try away. to ask. I'm guessing if, if, that, that just, just some fun things. Not even just completely off topic of, of the things that we discussed today so the first one and the last one everyone has been the same but the seven in between i, I revolve and change and um so we'll, we'll start out with, with the Ryder cup coming up this year uh a couple weeks actually um and a couple years ago that they they went to getting the crowd fired up and, and playing a, a walk-up song so if if you were in the Ryder cup team and you're going up to the first tee what what would your walk-up song be Oh, that'd be hard. It'd probably be a Chris Christopherson song of some sort or Willie Nelson, one or the other. And I'd have to go through their repertoire to find the one that was most appropriate for whatever was being teed off. But th- <laughs> okay. That's when music was music. Uh, let's see. Your favorite purchase under $1,000? Oh, pizza. <laughs> Any particular one where you are? Uh, no, just, I, I have to do gluten-free, so it'll be cauliflower crust or gluten-free, but pepperoni and cheese, extra cheese. Extra cheese. You know, uh, I don't know how we got on this. I asked my brother, cause he ordered it one time with a buddy of his, and ever since it's been our favorite, we get pepperoni and banana peppers. Yeah. The, the, Maybe the, other, the, other, the other one would be cowboy hats. My wife buys purses. I buy cowboy hats. Okay. I haven't seen you on Twitter with any of those on some. Maybe I, I try not to do Instagram. <laughs> I'm, I'm not. I'm not an influencer. I, I I would maybe I'd challenge you on that. I, I follow you and and enjoy your posts and and think we have a lot in common that way. But that that would be a completely different podcast. We could talk a lot about economics and social developments and governmental policy. Correct. Um, maybe I'll we'll have you on. We'll we'll gear that towards the golfing world more. 
Um, if Hollywood called you and said, Scott, we really love your story. We're going to make a movie about you. And we're going to let you cast the lead role. Who, who are you going to have play you? Oh, it, unfortunately, he probably can't do it now, but it, it would have been in his youth, Clint Eastwood. No brainer. Do, do, do you talk to him much? Uh, not too much anymore. You know, I, I've been uh, good buddies with him. I remember when Susan and I went to the Oscars and I hollered at him as he was crossing the street. He came over and he goes, what are you doing here? <laughs> I used to have respect for you. <laughs> That's my favorite Clint Eastwood line. Other than that, other than get off my lawn. <laughs> get off my Stanley Kowalski. <laughs> uh, what would be your superpower? Oh, jeez. Um, I think analogies, I just break things down into analogies very clearly and crisply. So I'll take a very complex situation and I'll spit it out in an analogy that may or may not embarrass whoever is making the argument, but it'll be brutally accurate, I think. And, and I, I can take somebody... I, the one person I couldn't, I, I could not take a Kamala Harris speech and give it an analogy that would, the, the word salads are hard, but you know, yeah, people you need are an trying interpreter. to explain things. Yeah. You need an interpreter to, to tell you what she's talking about and then try to analyze it. it, it that, that might be a little too difficult. Um, the most used app on your phone. Um, email then text, then Twitter. I'm always calling it Twitter. <laughs> I noticed. <laughs> and, and that, you know, that, that's when I, uh, when I messaged Conrad to, if he would reach out to you, because I, you, you, how often do you, you still get to Stanford, the golf course regularly? Yeah, I haven't been or? on the Siebel in about six days, but I went over there and I saw mm -hmm. Conrad and had a good catch up with him. He's such a good man. He is. And I, I love him to death. Um, but I had messaged him because I tried to message you on, on Twitter, but your account doesn't take messages and probably rightfully so. And I'm like, God, how am I ever going to get a hold of I have of Scott? to follow I, you for you to be able to DM me. So I'll, I'll uh, email me your handle and I'll go look at it. Absolutely. Um, if there was one rule to change in golf, which if, if they made you. Speed of play. <laughs> if you don't turn your card in in three and a half hours, you're disqualified. Give everybody helmets. And if you have to play, if Kepka has to play through, you better hope you have a helmet on. <laughs> but speed of play, it is, it is absolutely ridiculous. You have, you, you can do it two ways. You can have somebody with a buzzer and a you know a time clock that walk, walks around and you know clicks it, and you know, now you got forty seconds to get your shot off. Even if you mm -hmm. need a ruling, you better know the rules. You better not screw it up. You know, stuff happens. But you have 40 seconds, and everybody has to turn their card in in three and a half hours from their allotted tee time. And there, there's got to be, you know, like a Supreme Court ruling to get you to reinstate it if you don't get there. The game is so much better. As someone who's been in the ropes at, at the tour level, you, you, you know, you, as a parent, you, I'm sure you've had access inside the rope. What, what do you see that? that they are taking so long to play because the, the average person watches that on tour and the young kids coming up and they see these guys taking forever to play. What, what is it? Are, are they not, are they not doing their routine or their thing while the other person is incredibly ready to hit? selfish, self, self-absorbed and situationally unaware and they don't give a shit. That's what I think. But you know, Steph Curry doesn't, get to call time out and call a judge over before he does his three pointer. You know, you know, uh, you know, you, you don't tell the player not to return the tennis ball. Cause you want to like, think about where you're going to, I mean, it's a hockey place. Time out, time out, you know, where I'm, no, it, let's play the game. Mm -hmm. Let's, you know, you got plenty of time to be proactive. You can't be deliberate to the point of, it, it's just not fair to the, fans to the competitors and you know you'll have more time in your life if you just get the round done in three and a half hours yeah i, rem I remember in high school and i grew up in michigan you know went to high school middle school high school there it, it, you went to cranbrook but i remember playing in high school 
practice and matches, if, if you played in four hours, you got ridiculed big time. If you, if 350 was slow. If you weren't in 330 to 345, that's what you were expected to play in. As a foursome. I'm not talking about twosomes and three. I'm talking about a foursome. And somewhere along the lines, it, it's gotten with carts nowadays. I and mean, back then, everybody walked. Um, but yeah, it, it, something has happened to, well, to you really watch. make things smart. I mean, some of these guys will get the ruling official over there and they'll be five seven minutes trying to figure out something drop it hit it let's go on Mm -hmm. yeah you're going to drop it it's not going to be that much different if you drop it here drop it you know if you're if you're in the rough and you're dropping i mean you're right i agree with you so that's the change um this one i'm very interested to hear your answer because you've played so many great courses your favorite golf course The way I answer that one is, have I ever told you about the worst sex I ever had? (laughs) It was terrific. (laughs) So, so like like all the golf courses, they're they're all fun. They're all great. Um, You know, and even the little ones that weren't, like I used to caddy or watch my boys play Lincoln Park in in near San Francisco. And the course, you couldn't tell where the rough started and the fringe started in the green. It, it was just sort of a, it was, very fluid. it was very fluid and all the rest of it, but it was fun. You played the game. It was beautiful scenery. You know, it could be, you know, immaculate and all the rest of it. Although, you know, I play at the quarry in, uh, in Palm Springs and it's the most beautifully kept golf course. And I really like that too. Mm-hmm. Um, and I like everything in between. It's just, they're all terrific. Yeah. Get, getting outside, uh, you're in the sun, you're in the breeze. Hopefully it's not too hot like it is here right now, 105 <laughs> degrees and brutal. But it, it, even at that, it's just enjoyable to be outside. Usually, hopefully you're playing with somebody you like. <laughs> my favorite pain, foursome yes. is my four boys, my wife and me playing in a sixome and finishing in under three hours. That'd be pretty good. I'd, I'd, I'd pay to be, be in the ropes on that one and watch. Yeah, it's, it's a lot of fun. If you could sit in a golf cart and talk to anybody that you wanted to, it could be anybody, who, who, who would it be? That's a good question. Um, oh, shoot, I don't know. Because um, you've got a lengthy list of some very impressive people that you've come across in your life, I'd imagine. Probably Lee Kuan Yew. He was the benevolent dictator. So he was a guy who could have been abusive, but was incredibly constructive with the power that he had. Um, And uh, if we just had a bazillion of him and we could put him in power, then things would operate better. In the meantime, what we need to do is eliminate the power of most of the government because it is it is mm. it is not good people are not Lee Kuan Yew's I just would love to pick his brain and find out what made him tick and how power mm. didn't corrupt him it takes a very special individual f- for power not to affect them uh that, that that is not the driving motivating factor yep and then uh the last one in your opinion as far as golfers are concerned who's the who's the goat who's the greatest of all time because you've had up close to to a lot of them. Yeah, I, I I think I think Jack. I just I just think Jack. Um, he um, he he still has he still has the record. Mm-hmm. Although, <laughs> if Bernard Langer keeps winning oh. until he's a hundred, he might get my vote. That's impressive what he's doing. Yeah, as, uh, as I get older, I get more and more impressed with, with him. I Lee mean, the Trivino longevity. Is my favorite. If I had to, one guy to go play with, it would probably be, probably be Lee. Mm-hmm. It, it, yeah, that, that's saying a lot. You being a Stanford alum, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, if you want, I'll edit that out, and I won't, you know, then they won't come after you with the, uh, with the torches and. and... <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> I've said defund Stanford more than once on Twitter. Uh, what, you know, 
Normally, I'd wrap up, but I, I do have one question for you. It, with, with the uh, that I meant to get in during our discussion on the Live PJ Tour dynamic, especially with the Ryder Cup coming up, and and the discussion about who should be on the team, in in your opinion, uh, because it, it 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 touches on both sides of that topic. That um, the, the Live guys made the decision to go there with the under, probably a very good understanding that they would not be a part of majors or uh, Ryder Cups, Presidents Cups that that type of venue but he also is for if you take the integrity aspect or earning your way uh brooks uh had definitely played well enough in the big tournaments this year and, and until they what i read recently was you know that the tour had changed the rules on the points given for the bmw that it, if anyone finished up there which they did it would bump brooks out of his automatic selection so w- would you have him on the team would you not have him on the team or, or I, if you had a choice who, who, who would you pick I think the PGA Tour ought to have a vote of all of the members on whether or not he ought to be allowed. Because I think the PGA Tour, which as I, I'm not sure I understand this correctly. So, you know, I'm please have your folks bomb my Twitter site with the real answer. But I think the PGA Tour, has, it's, the Ryder Cup is a PGA Tour property. It, uh, PGA of America it has, has the rights Ameri- to the, P, to the Ryder the Cup. Well, so then they get to decide. Mm-hmm. And maybe they ought to have their members decide. And um, but you know, whoever owns it gets to decide. You know, if you have a club, you get to decide who gets to play in the club. And I'm okay with that. And you know, I there's a lot of clubs I tried to get really nice clubs I tried to get into, and they didn't wouldn't let me in because I'm a big mouth. <laughs> and I'm okay with that. I wouldn't join a club that would have me anyhow. Um, <laughs> I, I really believe in the right to associate. I was chatting with this gal once and she, you know, she was fairly um, progressive in her thinking. And we got into these arguments and I said, well, so what do you believe in the right to associate? She said, yes. I said, do you believe in the right to home ownership? She said, yes. I said, do you believe in the right of having a second home? Yes. Do you believe in the right of sharing ownership of that home with some of your, some of your, friends yes do you believe you could share a home with you know like a multi-acre kind of ranch place yes can that home put 18 flags in it no that's a golf course you can't have all guys owning a golf course all of a sudden you know no i believe in the right to associate i believe in the right to you know own ownership of, of a property, and I believe the right of exclusion for who you want to keep out. I just, I mean, and, and if you exclude the wrong people, people are going to, like, leave. Mm-hmm. You know, th- that's that's the deal. But, you know, I, so am I going to judge? No, I'm not. I mean, I will judge by whether I watch or not. And, you know, do I get to weigh in? I suppose as a fan I get to weigh in, but I, I choose not to. You know, let the owners of the of the property, let the owners of the Ryder Cup decide uh, who who they let in there. Yeah, I think it's a it's a personally. I, I think he should be a pick because he 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 as golf is a thing where you earn your place. He he played well enough in in the tournaments that he was allowed to garner points. I mean, he he's uh, seventh, I think, on the points list. Well, but Maverick, I, ought to, Maverick ought to be considered because before he got injured, he was 23rd on the FedEx Cup or something like that. So, you know, mm-hmm. let's extrapolate there. I don't know. Extrapolating is is a difficult thing, right? So, mm-hmm. um, I mean, the PGA Tour players all have different obligations. Yes. And, you know, weren't playing 54 holes. They were playing 72 holes and all – you know, and they, they had a more of a grind or whatever. You could say I, you, everybody can come up with lots of rationalizations for everything, but that's part of what makes sports fun and it mm-hmm. engages the fan. I, I I don't particularly worry about that. I think whoever owns the property, whoever owns the tournament, they decide. They get to make decisions. Yeah. Um, where can people follow you? Where's the best place? I know I follow you on Twitter, but uh... yeah, Twitter's the only thing I do. I do LinkedIn for for you know real work stuff, and I do Twitter just to be vocal. <laughs> and I'll have those links in the uh, summary. Everyone can check those out. Gift's got to follow. He's obviously got a lot of great information that he puts out there, and it's been a and pleasure I'm, to catch up with you. I'm always ready for for polite 
and constructive criticism. I love to hear. I change my mind when I hear a good a good reason to do so. Awesome, Scott. It's been a pleasure. I I will uh, stay on just a minute, and we'll, we'll have a little more conversation before we check out. Thank you, sir.